I love it. And, you know, it used to, you know, we've had people sometimes maybe they get baptized when they're younger and, and then they say, you know, I don't know if I really understood everything that was going on at the time. Can, you know, can I be baptized again? And okay, you know, we usually accommodate that. It's not, it's not a ceremony, sacrament, ritual that saves you, anything like that. So we usually accommodate that. I never had to do that because usually I get baptized a little bit every time I help. I get baptized a little bit. Now, more so when we had an actual baptistry. I told the group today, you know, we're doing organic baptisms. These are organic. We got the organic kind because with this trough, it's about as much water as you'd have in the stream. And so this is, this is kind of like the way the earth's earliest Christians would baptize. And the ancient, you know, the old church would do. And we'll just take you out to the stream. Uh, we do have the advantage, at least it's heated, but it's kind of organic. So we got organic baptisms going. And, you know, I just love that. We have a good time with that. You know, everything that goes on with it and... Uh, you know, is it the same? No, I mean, there's a pandemic going around. And well, I mean, it is the same because the most spatially distanced part of our sanctinasium is still the first two or three rows. So that is, that's the same. Uh, but outside of that, it's not the same. And so we spatially distance uh, non-family members as uh, much as we can. And, and you know, if you don't come in with a mask and you want one, we got masks for you. And we have fans going to increase airflow and things like that. And my opinion is, this is the absolute best time to be alive if you are actually really a believer by being born again. Amen. I mean, outside of the first century and living with the early apostles, this is the best time to be alive. Say, Alan, why? Because we have come full circle from the first century to the 21st century. We've come full circle. When I think about, you know, friends that we might have, we've been praying for, Pastor Mark Trotter is a good example. And I think about him and I think what he's going through and I think about how, and I felt like this for a long time, that we don't have persecution today, but you know what, we do have cancer. We do have, you know, some people go through things and like with what he's going through and we're, we're praying for healing, but I know that what he's going through right now is torture. I mean, it, it is as if, first century, they could, ancient world could not have devised something that's more tortured than what he's enduring. And so, okay, I think, all right, there are some favored people. God gives an opportunity even in our age, even if we don't have persecution. You know what? If we don't have persecution, we do have pandemic. We now have pandemic. And I know, you know, people want to say, yeah, but, you know, if I... If I, you know, if I come to church and I catch COVID, well, I might lose my job. Welcome to the first century. I mean, you can choose if you want to be like or you don't want to be like. I'm just saying, uh, we have an opportunity. Say, so, yeah, but you know, you know, one of my kids might catch it. And you know, what if they died? All right, well, there were Christians in the first century who suffered the death of their family members right in front of their face. So we, this is the greatest time. We have the greatest opportunity. I'm not telling you to do anything to go against your conscience or do what you want to do. I'm just telling you how I'm thinking. Even if I didn't have to be here, you know, the way I look at it is this. I can catch COVID any place. I mean, why would I not want to come and still come and take the reasonable precautions and praise God and pray and see people baptized and do things together like that I mean, I would just want to do that. And I'm not saying, it, I'm not dogging on anybody. I'm not judging anybody. I'm not judging those who are not here at all. I am just saying, telling you how I'm thinking about it for this reason. Because if you have people in your life who say, oh, I see how it runs. They can go to work, but they can't go to church on Sunday. They can go to work five days a week, but they can't go to church on Sunday. I see what that's all about. That's all I'm saying. If you have people in your life who look at you and say, okay, you can, take, you, know, you can take your Macy's coupons, go to Macy's on Saturday, but you can't go to church on Sunday. That's all I'm saying. All I'm saying is be cognizant, be aware. You have the greatest opportunity in history to be like Earth's earliest believers. I don't know what's going to happen with Pastor Mark Trotter, but I know this. I know what crown he's going to win. I know what crown he will wear when we get back together. And that is, such, that is such a great thing. 
So, you know, somebody had given me anonymously a Mahomes uh, jersey. I almost wore it today, but, uh, you know, I've wore my Andrew Reid shirt the other, uh, the other uh, playoff games, and I thought, you know, uh, I'm not superstitious at all, but uh, if Tampa Bay witchery were to work, I just don't want to be blamed, okay? I just don't want to be blamed, so I wore Andy Reid. I'll wear, I'll wear Mahomes during the game. Uh, and somebody reminded me today, as, since we're all thinking of Tampa Bay, and, you know, I'm dressed like that, and we got a pool actually right in front of us, and heated pool. And since we're all thinking of Tampa Bay, somebody reminded me that a year ago, I took a selfie from the platform to catch everybody in their chief swag. Now, I'm not a selfie person, but I know you are, so why don't you stand up? Why don't you stand up? And uh, so I'm going to put it on panorama first, I think. I'm going to try pan a pano first. I'm going to see how that turns out. So you stand here in your chief swag, and... Uh, can I do a panorama selfie? Well, let me see here. Let me see. I don't know if I can do. I mean, I may just have to do a regular selfie. No, I, I got to do a regular selfie. Okay, that's fine. I'll take. I'll take several. Okay, you ready? Okay, get you guys over here cheering, cheering for the Chiefs. Okay, get this crowd over here cheering for the Chiefs. And, and one straight down the middle. Jeez. All right, praise the Lord. We'll post those. You can go ahead and be seated. You can like and tag your friends. Romans chapter 3, if you have your Bible, open with me to Romans chapter 3. You know, in Romans chapter 1, Paul says, well, we know the pagans are under the wrath of God. I mean, obviously, the heathens fall under God's wrath. Then in chapter 2, he says kind of something that surprises us. The Jews, the most religious people on the planet, stand before God wiped out. So now Paul opens this poignant question that opens the first verse of chapter 3. What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? And, you know, I reminded you last time, Paul is debating a composite of all the opponents that he faced in all of the synagogues, in all of the Mediterranean, over all the places that he went. And he'd walk into a synagogue to preach, or in the marketplace, or in the school of Tyrannus, or wherever he may have been, and both Jews and Gentiles would come at him whenever he talked about the resurrection and the power of the gospel. So he anticipates the objections that we might have, and in doing that, he gives us sound doctrine today. And if, if all we saw last time in chapter 2 is true, and the Hebrew is condemned, as well as the heathen and the hypocrite, then why did God call the Jews in the first place? Well, you're asking good questions this morning, because the answer is to give them an advantage to bring to the world, watch, verse 2, much every way chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. The whole revelation of God in verbal format was entrusted to Israel. And here's our thesis for today's study. You knowing that you have the word of God enables you to answer, give answers to an unbeliever. It, it enables you to defend the faith. It enables you to get them the gospel in a credible way. It empowers you to walk in favor. It instills hope and a sense of humble confidence. And you are confident because of faith in God's word, yet you are meek because you know it's only by God's grace that you even heard God's word from the Bible. You know, a lot of preaching goes out today over airwaves done by preachers who don't practice and uh, people with no peace. And so if you're, you know, sitting in here and you're not asleep, I know just what you're saying. Alan, you know, I grew up to believe that, that I'm okay and you're okay. That's what, that's what they taught me in school. But what you're saying is, if I want to know what is wrong with the world right now, the answer is me. I mean, the answer, Alan, the answer is me. I mean, you're trying to tell me it is what is inside of me. It is my very being. So don't let me leave here till you show me. What principles are there here in Romans 3 
that will show me how God can take revival, give me revival by the gospel, so that I can see other people start getting saved because of my own testimony. I'd be glad to help you out because in the world, people are trying to suppress the truth. The devil has an agenda to suppress the true truth. In the world, the devil is trying to destroy God's plan of redemption. But just by virtue of the fact that you heard the word of, word, have the word of God in your King James Bible, you have a tremendous advantage because the Bible is your record of a covenant that God establishes with you, not based on your work, but based on his grace. Watch, look on your handout at Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, out of me, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So what God is going to do reviving us to reach our community through our harvest times, it's not even based on you. It is, it is based not even on your faithfulness. It is based on your faith in the faith of the Son of God to love you and give himself for you. Just like this verse says, it's not based on your perfection, it's based on God's promise. And that is why you need Bible principles down inside of you. So much so, Paul says to the Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, there on your handout, he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, all kinds of wisdom, wisdom you might need for anything. Because whether you know it or not, this is our first point for study, you are in a fight with an enemy for your destiny, and the word is your weapon and your warfare. So Paul raises a question about those Jews who were made custodians of the scriptures like we are today. Verse three, for what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Shall it make the faith of the son of God who loved us and died, us for, us, died for us of no effect? Does an unbelieving preacher nullify the power of God's promise? Uh, if you carry a Bible but you don't read it, does that mean it's not the Word of God? See, watch how Paul flipped the script in verse 4. God forbid. In other words, impossible. And Paul sit here sets the stage to compel us to recognize how if we are to ever fulfill our calling, if we are ever to have revival, then we cannot expect support from the circumference Support from the situation, support from the circumstance, support from the external. If we're going to bring the good news to a lost and dying world, we cannot expect props from the periphery. Because here's our second point for study. We cannot rely on or anticipate support from the outside of us, near us, or around us, but only from within us. Because you must have an ungrieved Holy Ghost who functions inside of you through the Word of God. Because he makes the Word of God do the work independent of anybody's outside support. I mean, you, can rely, you can't rely on others. You can only rely on your relationship with God. And then God, in relationship with others, will work to give you all the support that you need for both revival, personal revival, and outreach. So, their unbelief cannot nullify what God's word does for you. Verse 4, God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. It is very difficult to teach this in our time and our culture because we are so much not about this. And we as Americans have certain things ingrained in us. One thing that's ingrained in us is expanding our security horizons. That's why we do what we do militarily. That's why we have military bases in so many countries across this planet. We, do, we want to expand our security horizons to protect our trade. We want alliances so that we can keep our trade going. 
you know, and good capitalists that we are, and, you know, we want, uh, there are certain things. We want life and liberty to support our happiness. And we, and we just got to have that. And, and so it is so difficult to give a revival message in the midst of our culture as difficult as the job that Paul had when he wrote this letter to the Romans. But you know what he discovered and what you know and, 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 and you and I need to know is that when God speaks, God doesn't require everybody or even anybody to agree with him. God speaks and the word has within it the seed that accomplishes its own goals. The word of God will always do the work because God's truth is absolute. God's word is the authority. We don't have to elect a new president. We don't have to change parties. We don't have to call for an act of Congress. We don't even have to have the Supreme Court to agree with us because here's our third point for study. God's kingdom comes when God's will is done. And, and God's will is done whenever God's word is believed. I mean, how'd you miss that all these years? Our fundamental confession as Christians is that we are strangers down here. We are pilgrims passing through on this planet. And since earth is not our home and our citizenship is not here, then we are journeying through time in order to do traffic with eternity. So don't put your obedience to God's program on hold, waiting for everybody else to get with it, waiting for anybody else to get with it, waiting for the circumstance to be right, waiting for the vaccine to be available, waiting for the pandemic to die down, waiting for something else to go on. I wish I could just get 23 of you with a 1030 attitude to realize this. But Paul knows what you're thinking. And so he says in this diatribe, watch, verse 5, and here's what I need you to do. If you have your analog Bible in front of you, you really ought to put a, quest, a, uh, a quotation mark starting verse 5 at the word but. Quotation, quote, but if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? And what can he say? I mean, is, is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? Unquote. Now, they didn't have quotation marks in the ancient world, but you know that he's, he's quoting what you're saying in your own mind because he puts in parenthesis after that, I speak as a man. Oh, you know he's not calling you out by name. He's just saying, I speak as a man. And then he says, God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? Okay, verse 7, quote, For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory... Why yet am I also judged as a sinner? Now, that's, that's kind of rationalization, isn't it? That's kind of uh, a Jesuit cautiousry there. Uh, you, know, well, you know, it all works out good. I mean, it's, it's all about the end result and the bottom line and, 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 and not rather. And, and again, we know we're operating within quotation marks because Paul puts in parenthesis, he remarks and says, as we be slanderously reported, and some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, unquote. And then he says, you know, the people who say that, their damnation is just. And it's amazing when you get in tune with what the Holy Spirit is doing, how foes and forces align against you. And people can totally disagree. They can think that your God and your Bible are irrelevant and cockeyed and crazy and inconsequential and off balance and out of touch and not patriotic and everything else. And yet, you can still obey God because the power of God is always available for the will of God. Help me, Holy Spirit. Don't put your confidence and your faith on hold. Don't put signing up to serve on hold. Don't put signing up to help with our harvest kids on hold. Don't put signing up to be on a harvest team on hold. Don't, don't wait for somebody else to affirm you or acknowledge you or support you. You don't have time to waste. This is the time of the end. This is truth for our end time, for the time of your new birth. 
you know, from, from the time you get saved to the moment of your death, God is calling you forward. Satan is pulling you backward. Hell is trying to get its handle on you, and the devil is out there to depress you and to defeat you. We no longer have time not to get out the gospel. This last paragraph is a fitting climax to the entire section that occurs right after the introduction, which started back in chapter 1, verse 18. And at this point, I like to look at the Apostle Paul like a relief pitcher. Anybody remember back in the day, there was a, the Royals had a relief pitcher called uh, uh, Roboski? What was his name, Roboski? They, they had a phrase they referred to him. And, and whenever he was called in, I, he had this whole thing that he went through. I mean, he was all, it, was like a, it was like watching a movie, a drama. And he would do his thing, and he was pretty good. And, and, you know, and he'd strike out the other side, and you know, it, was, you know, it was really good. Well, here's, here's the Apostle Paul. He's called in from the dugout. And he's, he's called in, you know, from, uh, from warming up, and it's the eighth or ninth inning. He is the closer, and he comes in to replace the starting pitcher and put the game away. Paul closes all debate right here with determination and authority. And this passage is the clincher. It is the closer in this section of the book of Romans. And like no other, it tells us the truth about humankind, the truth about ourselves, and the bottom line is, I'm not okay. You're not okay. Because Paul reveals to us three penetrating truths about humankind. First, number one, we are all universally sinful. We are wicked, we are wasted, we are wiped out. Now let me open a window on that word because, you know, there was a submarine one time, the United States built, it was an attack submarine against Soviet subs and it was the quietest and the, and the fastest of its day, had the most advanced weapons systems, they thought it was indestructible. But it went out to do some deep dive trials, and, you know, it paused every 30 meters uh, to make sure all its systems were okay and then lowered to the test depths all of a sudden, it disappeared off the radar, uh, you know, out of communication, and the sailors up, up top thought, well, you know, this, something's wrong with our equipment. But the shattered hull of that sub was on the seafloor a mile and a half below the surface, and the only recoverable piece was a one-foot-long piece of gnarled pipe. I mean, that's a wipeout. That is how... That is how your friends stand before God. That is how your family stands before God. That is how the human race stands before God. Verse 9, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles, they are all a mile and a half under sin, crushed. We're all a wreck at the bottom of the sea. We were born in sin. We began in sin. When we got old enough, we embraced sin. And the urgency is, if we don't get the gospel out, they all go to hell. That is the fury behind our hurry. We don't have time not to get the gospel out. You know, the superpower Roman Republic of the first century has now come full circle to the superpower American Republic of the 21st century. Jesus is coming soon. We don't have time not to get the gospel out. Paul now quotes six Old Testament passages because number two, we are all helplessly depraved, meaning there's nothing in our unregenerate selves to commend us to God. Watch verse 10. As it is written, there's none righteous, no not one. Because first, letter A, our character is corrupt. Not a single one measures up to God's standard of glory. So in verses 10 to 12, Paul quotes Psalm 14, verses 1 to 3. People are unreasonable because our mind is depraved. Uh, verse 11, there is none that understandeth. And Paul uses words like none, all, and not one eight times in four verses. And people are unresponsive, not just because not just because their mind is depraved, but also because their heart is depraved. Watch verse 11. There is none that seeketh after God. So finally, our will is depraved. Our mind, our heart, our will, the whole person. Verse 12. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. They, I mean, add them all up and there's still nothing worth saving. There's none that doeth good, not one. 
Because second, letter B, our conversation is corrupt. You say, but Alan, I voted for light rail in Kansas City. I mean, I wear red on Friday. I cheer for the Chiefs on game day. Okay, but follow some research that the Apostle Paul had Dr. Luke do for him. Because he uses the human body now as the illustration of our corruption. First, our speech is vile and scary, verse 13. Their throat is an open sepulcher. Well, well, how does an open grave gullet operate? Verse 13, with their tongues they have used deceit. Oh, lies. Big lies, little lies, white lies, other lies. Second, our speech is venomous like a snake. The poison of asps is under their lips. Well, why? What is so aspy about our conversation? What is the poison sack uh, uh, underneath the fang? Oh, it's in verse 14, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Now, let me draw down the application even gooder. For mouth, read timeline. Read post. Read political opinion. At, you know, and this is another revival message, and nobody preaches like this today, and there, and there are reasons why. I mean, every, and every Sunday I wake up and have the, you know, this fear, nobody's going to be there this week. Nobody's going to be there. They're, the, you know, they're all going to leave because you can't preach like this. You know, you got to go with the flow and do what everybody else is doing. But let her see, our conduct is corrupt. That's why our conduct is corrupt, verse 15. Their feet are swift to shed blood. And because we are hell-bent for the chains that we want, we bring about misery. Now, notice here how the verses get shorter just like small bursts of machine gun fire, all connected by a colon. Watch verse 16. Destruction and misery are in their ways, colon. Oh, but wait. I'm going to describe American life to a T. Verse 17, and the way of peace have they not known, colon. Because we want our way as though we mutiny against God's way, which for the true believer is always the way of peace. That's the way of God. Why do we fail so miserably like this? Verse 18, there is, because there is no fear of God before their eyes. We are all totally depraved, which leaves us in a helpless condition. So number three, we are all hopelessly lost. Verse 19, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and the world may become guilty before God because we are a nation of laws. We are just like the ancient Romans. We are a republic under a constitution, constitutional republic, representative republic run by laws, and no one is above the law. And so now Paul is referring to the, the particular time when humans start to shape their conduct by statute and by precept and by code of behavior, just like good Romans. Yet we still end up with a hopeless case because... The law can never make you right. Verse 20, therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in God's sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Just because we're a nation of laws, our laws don't make us right. Your law, the law only defines when you've gone wrong. But if you give me one more minute, I, I, I just want to take another further. I, I, don't want you to I don't want to leave you in such a mess today. It's not good for church growth and uh, not good for edification. So how do we get to the point where the gospel brings revival? What should we expect to see God do? Because of our harvest teams and other things, especially right now and even during the pandemic, arrogance says, look what I did for God, but testimony says, here's what God did through me. So you need to know this in order to grow into your testimony. That, you know, and that's the only goal we have for our harvest teams between now and Easter. Have, have one meeting sometime this month, even later this month, and one meeting in March so that people can be told and taught how to put their testimony together and then given an opportunity to share it with the rest of the group so that they can share it with every, anybody and everybody. Why? Because here's our fourth point for study. It's not what you have in you that's deficient if you're saved. You have all you need with the Holy Ghost inside. So in reality... It is what you bring out of you that makes the difference. What are you bringing out of you? 
God puts your salvation inside, as he says to the Philippians, you got to work it outside. Now, this looks like a conservative crowd, but give me permission to preach to the 20, 23 radicals who came to church today, because this isn't a sermon, it's a message. And you can either have God, you know, work in your life and you can work God's dream, or you become a dream killer. And you, it is a, you, you know, you can kill the dream for everyone. And so all I'm trying to say is, and this is our fifth point for study, I've got to give you insight on your birthright so you can bring a floodlight to our twilight. Hello, somebody. You cannot pursue revival if you lack insight on the gospel. And insight does not mean an intellectual apprehension it means that we will, it means what we will all give each other in our harvest teams. Because here's our sixth point for study. The thing that makes you, makes your knowledge insightful and your testimony powerful is not that you're so smart. It's just that it happened to you. It's just that that piece of truth is yours. You experienced it. Now, I don't know what more I can say about this passage. I, you know, and I know some of it was not strictly an exposition, uh, you know, expository preaching, but it was an exhortation. Don't go searching for a blessing. Just be obedient. Whatever happened to that, just be obedient. Be faithful with the blessing God has given you. Be a good steward of the gospel God has entrusted to you. I mean, if we were to imagine the whole world is an island. And we know that this island is going to be destroyed by a meteor strike. And fire and brimstone is going to come out of heaven. It's going to, it's going to wipe the island out. There are no boats. There are no ferries. There's only one way to get off the island and spared from destruction, and that is a bridge. And prior to destruction, every person has to cross that bridge to safety in order to be saved. And, and so God has given to chosen groups of people flashlights that'll shine for 100 yards. And they're to use their flashlight as a searchlight and shine it on that bridge as the only channel, the only way, the only passage provided to salvation. And take their flashlight and lead others across the bridge. If you are already saved today, what are you doing with your flashlight? Boy, it's really wonderful to have a flashlight. I mean, I'm so glad that my family has got this flashlight. We came across that bridge. I mean, what do you mean? I've got a, God is expecting me to go back across, back to that island with my light. What do you mean? So... What I mean is you need to be all in. I mean, we saw some number of people, kids and adults, I don't remember, uh, you know, if it was 15 or however many, uh, you know, we may have had. And when they got baptized today, they said, I'm all in. I'm all in for what God wants me to do. I'm, I'm putting the, I understand and I'm picturing it to everybody else. This flesh, my old life, it's dead. I'm rising up. I'm actually alive by the new life of Christ in me. I'm all in. So I know I'm not talking to everybody in here, but for the 23 people for whom this matters, and you're interested in helping our, with our harvest kids, you're interested in, in, in being on a harvest team, and you dream about the gospel, I'm going to ask you to dream like a fool. You, you've got a dream, a dream so radical because the norm is apathy and status quo. And you've got to pray some prayers for some people that you don't believe will even get saved. And you've got to ignore what you don't have and you've got to start seeing the invisible and hearing the inaudible and doing the impossible with what you do have. Every head bowed, every eye closed. First thing I want to do, I want to pray for the gospel dreamers today. If you are willing to be radical because you've walked, you already walked through hell with gasoline in your pockets, and, and you've waded through high water in concrete shoes, and you had your heart broken, and you've been smacked down by Satan, 
but you are determined, despite the fear and everything else, that as long as you got breath, you got fight left. Will you commit to help our harvest kids get back here so we can stop Satan plundering the next generation? Will you commit to be on a harvest team, to have some small group interaction that will make you a better believer at, at getting out the gospel and being evangelistic? Will you commit to some type of every member ministry in our church? If, if you'll do that, will you raise your hand right now? Just raise your hand so I can see it. Just raise your hand and put it back down. And you know what? This is not even for me or anybody else because, frankly, if you don't actually sign up, we, don't, we won't even know that you raised your hand. This is just for God to see. Are you as all in as the people who got baptized today? I mean, who cares about the meme that says, what didn't kill me made me stronger? No, what didn't kill me made me a deadly fighter. I don't have to be stronger. I got the Holy Ghost inside. Just raise your hand and tell God and the devil, God, I'm still dreaming. I'm still praying. I am still praising. I am still witnessing. I am still so with me. Yeah, that's fine. Even if you're not coming and attending in person, but you're online. And you can go ahead and laugh at me. I'm a fool for Christ. They laughed at Jesus all the way to Easter Sunday. But just like Psalm says, God had the last laugh. The bridge is the gospel. If you are unsaved, you must cross it. Salvation is Jesus. He stands on the other side having loved you and given himself for you. All you have to do is pray right now and say, God, I know you love me. Because you loved me enough, as I heard today, you loved me enough to send Jesus to die so you could save me. Jesus, I trust you for eternal life. I want to receive you today by putting my faith in you right now, by believing you did exactly what the Bible says, by believing that you are hearing me as I pray and you are offering me eternal life as a gift of your grace. So God, forgive my sins for Jesus' sake. I want to be born again. I want to start becoming in Christ the person you saved me to be by the gospel. Jesus, I will never be ashamed of you. So here, I give you my life. And if you prayed like that or you want to be baptized... Next time that we do baptisms, you want to join our church or you want to, you know, have already been saved and baptized, you want to join here or you want to be discipled or you need any other spiritual help or assistance, just come to the front. When we get done, let us know. I want to give you a copy of my book, Next Steps for New Believers, or call, text, email us and let us know. Go ahead and stand and let's pray. Father, I thank you today for the glories of the Word of God, for the glories of the Bible, for the glories of your Son, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for the blood that streams through the five open wounds on his body. That is how he loved us. That is how he gave his life for us. The Old Testament tells us the life of the flesh is in the blood. He gave his blood so that we could have his life. And Lord, we want to be alive by that life. God, I don't want to operate anymore in fear. I don't want to be distrustful of you. I want, to, I want to follow the Holy Spirit's leading. I want to live according to my conscience underneath you in, in complete soul liberty, where I can go if I want to go and stay home if I don't want, you know, if I need to stay home. I can... I can Feel the freedom of the Spirit to do that, and yet knowing that you're going to use me at this time. And this is the best time that I could possibly have been born in because it's more like the first century believers than any other time I could be alive. And Lord, the opportunity I have to show people who are lost the reality of eternal life and the viability of invisible things. And Lord, only I can do that through my testimony. Only I can do that through the life I live in front of them and the word that I'm willing to give them of the gospel through my testimony. So Father, be with us to help us do that this week and the coming months ahead. 
We ask it in the precious and powerful name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Stay in the Bible, share the gospel, no service tonight because this was a Super Sunday and oh yeah, somebody as cool as playing uh, in the Super Bowl. Wednesday night, viewing group for D2 uh, or you can premiere it with us online. Love you, have a great week. You're dismissed. <laughs>